Hello, everyone. This is Kimberly with Stroudwater Associates in our Portland, Maine office. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. A couple of housekeeping items before we get underway. We will be sending the materials for the webinar after the event later this afternoon or early tomorrow. Look for that. If you have any questions um, that aren't addressed within the presentation, please use the chat function and uh, we'll save a little bit of time at the end to ask the presenters um, specific questions from the group. Um, with that, I'd like to give you just a brief overview on Stroudwater Associates and what we do. Um, we are a leading national healthcare consulting firm. We serve healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We have a 34-year track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. And we have um, offices in Atlanta, Nashville, and Portland, Maine. I will now introduce our two speakers for today. In our Portland office, we have Jeff Summer. He is our managing director, and prior to being the managing director, he was the leader of our affiliations and partnerships in capital planning and access service lines. For more than 25 years, he's focused on assisting clients with strategic initiatives, including planning and executing major capital projects, analyzing strategic options, and crafting of innovative affiliations, and executing business development opportunities. From our Atlanta office today is Ryan Sprinkle. He's a senior consultant and he's also the practice leader for the firm's performance improvement group. He works with regulated clients to meet business objectives with strategies that address hospital physician alignment, affiliation and partnership ventures, and long-term strategic positioning. He has supported affiliation clients across the country in both buy-side and sell-side engagements. So those are the two presenters for today. And before we get started, um, I'm just going to launch a poll about who we have on the phone to better understand our audience. Um, you're going to see a poll come up and that's interactive. Um, what best describes your role within the organization? Uh, leadership, representing the board, a physician, uh, legal counsel, or um, affiliated in some other capacity? We'll give people a moment to let their uh, fingers wake up as they put down their lunches. Looks like we've got um, nearly three quarters representing uh, leadership, which, which tracks with what we um, expected for this webinar. About 70% leadership, 26% in the other category. And I am going to close the poll out and share the results. Um, yes, about 70% in leadership, just 3% at the board level, and other category rounding out at 28%. Thank you for that. Um, and with that, we will turn it over to Jeff Summer, who's going to kick off the webinar today. Thank you so much, Kimberly, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope you find the topic um, uh, interesting. And certainly in our practice nationally, we um, find that um, boards and leadership teams often grapple with developing a um, accurate and robust picture of strategic and operating risk for their organizations. So we're going to talk about um, understanding and assessing uh, a risk profile, sources of strategic risk, what's going on in the industry that's creating a particularly uncertain and dynamic and risk-laden environment, and then lastly, some tools and approaches for mitigating risk. Ryan and I will, will trade off here as we walk through uh, today's webinar, so you'll, you'll be hearing from both of us. Um, this is a construct that I'm sharing with you that came from a uh, prominent law firm, Weill, Gottschall, and Mangies, and uh, as they look at board functions, um, certainly we, we all are aware of the duty of care, loyalty, and obedience that not-for-profit board members uh, should uh, operate under. There are some specific areas that boards often have responsibility for. So in terms of providing oversight of management around approving budgets, financial plans, financial statements, um, and allocating capital, the board is involved in those decisions. 
most boards uh, function, I think, pretty well in, in that regard. Um, selecting, monitoring, and evaluating and compensating um, the CEO. Uh, also, I think most boards do a reasonable job of that. Uh, Compliance-related matters. This is an area of, I think, increasing challenge uh, just because of the regulatory complexity of the industry and how um, that th those changes have accelerated in recent years. We do see boards, um, uh, some boards, struggling with staying on top of compliance and associated risks. Um, Establishing uh, the composition of the board and committees and determining governance practices. Again, I think most boards have a reasonable approach to this. Uh, you do find occasionally um, boards that, that have um, really not stayed current with best practices. Um, and there are some certainly uh, examples of where uh, boards become so um, static and stagnant and, and perhaps um, uh, entrenched that, that bad uh, results, there's conflicts of interest or, or other things that emerge. Um, I think we've, we've all seen headlines both recently and over recent years where, where those things have occurred. And so uh, certainly keeping on top of, of those practices, whether it be term limits and, and a board self-evaluation are important. Um, two areas um, where we find boards, I think, struggle in particular. Uh, first being defining, reevaluating, and monitoring the long-term strategy by which the organization fulfills its mission. I think this is a challenge for a lot of uh, organizations, and it's, it's difficult to create the time and carve out the time to assess, are we on track on our strategic plan and the trajectory we thought we were on, or are we off course? And if we're off course, what are the, the changes we need to uh, make to get back on track? This is an area where I think organizations sometimes are allowed to drift. Uh, or continue on a track that may not be in their best interests for longer than would be prudent. Uh, and it's related to the final point, which is understanding the organization's risk profile and reviewing and overseeing the organization's management of risks. And, and as we think about an organizational risk profile, um, certainly um, ones that, that rise to the strategic level because they, given time, could threaten the mission of the organization, the sustainability of the organization, or even the existence of the organization over time are the ones that are of, of gravest concern to us and certainly should be for boards. But I think all too often boards are not as um, current um, as, as perhaps they need to be. Um, and so as we think about risk or strategic risk for organizations, we think about four um, vectors of risk. One that I think is oftentimes uh, quite well-defined, uh, financial, looking at revenue, uh, revenue trends, cash flow, cash flow margins, and operating margins, um, clearly key indicators for most organizations. We get into operating metrics, and these clearly have downstream implications for financial, but um, full-time equivalents, paid staff, work staff per uh, adjusted occupied bed, AOB, that's what that stands for. Case mix index as an indication of both whether the coding processes in the organization are are where they need to be, has there been a fall off, and also has the clinical mix um, of patients evolved in a way that's adverse to the organization and either says something about how the patient population is perceiving the organization or changes in the medical community in terms of what types of cases they're comfortable caring for locally. Payer mix, clearly a key indicator. Um, if, if your commercial patients are leaving the market and going to competitors, it's very difficult to remain solvent, financially viable with a patient base that is comprised of Medicare, Medicaid, and self-pay overwhelmingly. So it's important to, to monitor that and certainly volumes and key services because we're in a high fixed cost industry. Volume and volume growth makes a tremendous amount of difference to organizations. When we think about market indicators, clearly market share is one we're all familiar with. It's a lagging indicator um, and one that we're often looking at data that's at least a year old, maybe as much as two years old, depending upon the time of year. Um, so it, while very helpful and instructive, you are looking in the rearview mirror. Consumer preferences uh, and the, stand, or the reputation of the organization, both I think on a quality perspective, but also on a cost or price perspective are quite important. And I would add a third element to that reputation, which is uh, uh, customer service. Um, are folks able to get be seen in the emergency department uh, within a, a reasonable period of time and one that performs well relative to competitors? 
all very important. Value, we're really talking about the interplay between cost or price to the consumer and quality, and also what is the organization's capacity and capability to manage risk as we move into new uh, uh, payer uh, models. Um, the strategic risk profile of most hospitals and health systems is quite dynamic, but the changes can be subtle and, and go unnoticed, unfortunately, for, for too long. Um, each of these four domains um, describe the major sources of risk as, as we have experienced them on behalf of our clients. It's important to note that these, these risk domains are not segregated. Uh, poor performance in one area can spill over and impact other areas. Uh, so it, it, there's a contagion that can occur uh, and really undermine uh, the, the organization's entire um, strategic risk profile and prospects. Um, we think it's really critical to manage and, and certainly monitor long-term trends. Um, and I think it's a theme you'll hear from Ryan and I today that comparison to budget or comparison to prior year period is not adequate or sufficient. Um, Ryan and I co-authored an article um, on behalf of the American Health Lawyers Association um, at their annual transaction conference going back two years. And this looked at a, um, a metaphor of a recent maritime disaster, uh, the El Faro, which sank uh, on October 1, 2015. And the question is, as Ryan and I were thinking about strategic risk and hospitals that become uh, distressed is how does an organization um, move and evolve in a way where their risk profile becomes dangerous to the point where it, it potentially threatens the very existence of the organization. And we actually, in, in thinking about the El Faro, thought it was a, a worthwhile uh, metaphor, if you will, a modern, uh, although outdated, but modern by, by certainly uh, the history of, of maritime endeavor, uh, ship with, with satellite communications. Uh, finds itself in harm's way uh, with a class three hurricane and ultimately leading to the loss of the ship and, and the entire crew. How does that occur? And in looking at that disaster and the reports afterward, it was a fundamental um, um, failure of judgment to assess risk uh, and assess the risks that the, the age of the ship and its equipment uh, posed to the crew given a, an extreme weather event and um, really a, a, a poor judgment in terms of what the risks of being in harm's way of a Category 3 hurricane would be. Um, unfortunately, in our national practice, one of the more common regret, regrets we hear from board members uh, and sometimes manage, members of management is, I wish we'd had this con conversation previously. I wish we'd had this information previously. Um, I remember one board member coming up to us and we, we had a very successful engagement with them. They were very pleased with the outcome. But his regret was if we'd had this conversation two years previously, we would have conserved our balance sheet or substantial resources on our balance sheet and not put ourselves in, in harm's way the, way the way events unfolded. So our takeaway in thinking about the El Faro, and there's, there's more information on this and, and, and crosswalking this maritime disaster to kind of the profile we, we see in in organizations that may not appreciate their risk profile and how they become come into harm's way, is that the, the ship did not have to be in the in the, in the way of the hurricane. It was it was relatively easy um, to take evasive a action uh, to to not be in harm's way. Once in harm's way, in a little less than two hours, they the crew went from riding out a class three hurricane in the comparative safety of a of a, a large uh, cargo vessel to having to abandon ship into the eyes of a hurricane. The ship was lost, and unfortunately, the, the lives of the entire crew were lost along the way. Had there been an accurate assessment of the risks posed by the aging vessel, its equipment, and the hurricane, it would have been comparatively easy to steer the ship out of harm's way. And so human judgment and then um, a flawed assessment of the risks was seen as being uh, really critical to this tragedy. Um, in this case, for hospitals, I think it's really important for leadership teams and boards to have an accurate annual assessment of risk and um, not wait until everybody in the boardroom uh, agrees that things are really dire. If you wait until everybody in the boardroom agrees that, that the organization is at significant risk, you've, you've waited too long and you've, you've actually burned through a significant amount of resources. 
So uh, our suggestion, uh, based upon our practice nationally and, and, and working with, with um, hundreds of organizations over the last decade, is that it's critical that boards and leadership teams quantify the organization's risk profile on an annual basis and compare how, how that risk profile is evolving year to year um, and, and, and over multiple years uh, so that you can take timely action if you do see a material degradation of the organization's strategic and operating risk profile. All right, we will go on to our next polling question. Um, given what you've just heard from Jeff and of course your own insights as being a leader with your organization, um, how well do you think your board understands your organization's risk profile? Do you think it's completely, moderately, or not at all? Um, so I've opened that up for interactivity for everyone to have an opinion here for a couple seconds. And again, how well do you think your board understands the organization's risk profile? Uh, looks like the predominant answer is 81-ish percent right now at moderately. Um, give people a couple more seconds. Looks like most people have voted, so I'm going to close out of the poll and I'm going to share the results with you. All right, um, we're showing that we have 10% say there's a complete understanding and an overwhelming amount say it's right down the middle at moderate with 7% at not at all. All right, Jeff, are we going back to you? I think it's Ryan to take the helm, so to speak. Thank you, Kimberly, and take it away, Ryan. Yeah, good, good afternoon, and, and thank you again to those uh, attending our, our webinar today. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, pulling back and looking at a more macroeconomic level at the overall industry trends that are really impacting and enhancing the risk profile within um, the hospital sector and health system sector today. Uh, so it's it's easy to 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 know that uh, all of us that are active in this market in this industry that this is a disruptive period um, with. Uh, continued evolution in, in regulatory structures out of out of DC and state capitals, as well as um, market forces from new participants in the in the healthcare industry uh, joining the fray. It's a it's a difficult time to run and manage hospitals and health systems. Um, overall, there's a number of factors that are really um, when you drill down uh, working towards this overall disruption. Uh, just to point out a few here that we've listed. I just uh, you know, spend some time to focus on the accelerated shift to outpatient care. So, you know, uh, at least for the last uh, uh, 20 years, if not longer, we've seen a continued migration of services from an inpatient to an outpatient setting, and that really requires uh, healthcare organizations to to shift the focus of both their assets and their facilities to better serve patients in those environments, and then having the, the personnel and other resources to deliver that outpatient care. Uh, again, um, consolidation and the entrance of, of new um, participants in this market has been a market activity over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, most notably uh, in, in addition to hospital to hospital or large health system to health system transactions. Um, you know, we've seen over the last handful of years uh, activity among uh, many of the payers and non-traditional uh, non um, participants, Aetna, CVS, Walmart, Humana, and uh, the, the, the Haven um, joint venture between Amazon, Berkshire, Hathaway, and, and J.P. Morgan, which really continues to be a black box to many in the industry about how they're going to play a role and play a disruptive role in the market. And overall, these, these external factors, these macroeconomic forces are really causing um, patients to increasingly act like consumers. And for hospitals and health systems and the leaders of those organizations, um, treating a patient like a consumer really requires you to speak a new language, think about service delivery um, from an entire new framework, and um, uh, refocus the way that uh, you, you plan and interact with the patient, enhance that patient experience and the patient outcome. Uh, you know, just recently this spring, uh, MedPAC, the Medicare and Medicaid Payment Advisory uh, uh, Committee, uh, released an update to their annual survey uh, to Congress where they looked at um, declining 
Medicare margins across the hospital industry, uh, both for the not-for-profit hospitals, uh, all hospitals, including critical access hospitals, and in the for-profit uh, hospitals across the country. And as you can see here, uh, those Medicare margins are expected to uh, continue to decline, uh, primarily in these out years, as the labor market continues to be rather robust. That's going to create some pressure around pricing um, and other areas of, of cost increase for these operators, which make it harder um, to allow you to cover your costs through your Medicare patients, which traditionally has been the formula. Uh, you cover your costs through through Medicare. Uh, you you do uh, some of your, your your charitable work through uh, charity and um, uh, Medicaid, and then you really make margin off of commercial insurance. So this forecasted and and really not even just forecasted, but actually experienced decline in Medicare margins uh, is is putting a focus on um, healthcare system leaders to explore opportunities for growth um, and for uh, tightening the belt. Uh, this is also occurring against the backdrop, backdrop, as we discussed earlier, of that patient continuing to act increasingly as the consumer. So over the last nine to ten years, uh, there's just been marked growth in the number of, of firms, whether it's large employers or small employers, that are putting their employees on the high-deductible health plans, making that patient responsible for an increasing amount of first-dollar exposure. And again, that that uh, that directly implicates um, the way that patient behaves, making them more uh, consumeristic, going to shop around. Uh, it requires hospitals and health systems to focus on price and pricing transparency. And importantly, uh, when you're working with um, more directly with consumers around payment, um, there's been some specific implications around uh, the level of bad debt that's been experienced across the country. Um, for individual hospitals, as well as enhancing business office operations to ensure that uh, you're collecting those co-pays or those deductibles more early and not really becoming a bank um, to assume the risk around payment. Uh, and additionally, you know, this, this chart here just looks at a national trend relative to, to New York State as but an example. But if we match this against any other state in the country, the, the trend line would probably can you know be consistent with what we see here, and that's a continued decline in inpatient admissions, inpatient utilization across the country. And the the challenge for health systems is that in many of the communities that, that we find ourselves working with is uh, you've got these legacy facilities, these legacy assets that have been fundamentally configured to deliver inpatient care. And with declining inpatient utilization and a continued focus on outpatient and ambulatory care, uh, there's a real need to take these capital assets, reinvest into them, and reconfigure them um, for outpatient and ambulatory care or build those types of, of care settings. And, and many of the clients that we've worked with are, are challenged in their ability to do this given limitations around the balance sheet for many of the factors that you know, we've discussed previously. So each year, um, the uh, the bond rating agencies, Moody's, Standards, um, Standard & Poor's, uh, Fitch, they all release guidance around the outlook for the not-for-profit hospital sector for the for the given year. Uh, Moody's uh, earlier this spring or late in 2018, and providing that guidance for 2019, they pointed to many of the same macroeconomic factors that we've addressed this uh, this morning, this afternoon, and looked at how you know. There's an anticipated decline in operating cash flow across the entire sector, whether it be flat or out, outright decline, and an increase in bad debt, which will um, have consequences for not-for-profit hospitals and their ability to, to make margins sufficient to reinvest into their facilities. Um, that decline in operating cash flow is projected for this year around uh, 1%. Uh, that's kind of consistent with the trend line that the MedPAC study showed over the last several years. Um, and, it, and it really uh, relates back to ongoing areas of expense increase, both labor and non-labor. Think about all the IT costs inside of a healthcare organization today versus 10, um, 15 years ago. Um, that alone represents, a, in many instances, a significant spend of resources that uh, 10 years ago uh, weren't even uh, on the table. 
And, and as a result of, of these factors and, and others that we've addressed today, uh, the, the overall projection is that bad debt will continue to increase, which again um, forces organizations to really focus on uh, those set of other risk factors that um, we're going to address um, in today's webinar and ways to mitigate those risk factors given these external pressures that are being experienced. And, you know, while it's, it's easy to, to step back and evaluate um, these risk factors or these macroeconomic trends, there's, there's a real um, on-the-ground uh, impact to what's being experienced on the changes on the regulatory front, uh, the disruption from new entrants, and then just the fundamental changes in the way healthcare is being delivered today. And what we've witnessed across the country over the last um, at least nine years as we've tracked it here is really just a, a vast increase in the number of hospitals that have closed. Um, by our account, 125 rural hospitals have closed since uh, 2010, and uh, 68 urban hospitals have closed um, during that same period. And if we you know, look through the bankruptcy um, court data information, we'd see that there's also um, multiple hospitals that have found themselves in either Chapter 11 or, or Chapter 7 during the same period. And I, I grew up in a, in a rural community, a small town, and, and I know the impact that the, the hospital has on that local economy. And anytime you're doing economic development, if you've got that, that new plant or that new large employer that's coming into town to evaluate whether or not to locate uh, in your community, they're typically going to ask one of two questions out of the gate. How good are your schools? And where is the closest hospital? And if you can't um, give a good answer to either one of those, they're, they're typically on to the next town. And so uh, this is there's a real impact. There's a real human cost to, to hospital closures. And um, the purpose of today's webinar is, is really to focus on um, helping boards uh, and hospital leadership develop a holistic appreciation for sources of risk and then uh, drilling into those strategies or approaches to mitigating those sources of risk. Jeff? Thank you, Ryan. Uh, much appreciated. So we, we come back to this uh, framework that we've shared with you, um, as financial operating value and market-driven uh, vectors. Um, we wanted to use that as a basis for another polling question that I think Kimberly is going to uh, share with you. Yes, let me cue that up. Um, which areas of risk in your organization is least well understood? Which area do you think is least well understood? Um, financial, operating, market, or value? And you can see examples for each of those financial cash flow with your operating margin, um, operating, which could be your case mix index or your payer mix, market, which could be consumer preference, reputation, or value, uh, those things making up cost, quality, and managing risk. Give people a few more moments to respond. Um, we've got about 50% of voted so far. And let's see, it looks like 67% are coming in saying value is the least understood at this point. So I'm going to close out of this in just a second and share everything. All right, 12% reported financial is least understood. Um, another 12% say it's operating. The fewest amounts say market, and by the landslide majority is value. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so one of the things we want to share with you today is some of the tools that we use to uh, assess risk. And this is one, uh, it's, a, it's a financial uh, uh, chart that is extremely helpful uh, to us and our clients to understand overall trends. This is uh, uh, from a, an actual client of ours. The, the name has been blinded. The vertical bars are operating EBITDA, operating earnings before interest, appreciation, and amortization, good proxy for operating cash flow. Um, and you can see there's a trend line. The dotted line is a trend line from 2013 to 18. So their performance has been, been trending upwards from a, a dip, a significant dip in 2014, and then rebuilding performance. 
Um, on this chart, we have three thresholds of performance that are the horizontal lines there, red, orange, and blue. The red line we call survive. That is, is there enough operating cash flow to make debt service payments? Uh, in this case, with the exception of 2014, more than adequate to meet uh, debt service payments. The next threshold we call sustain. This is you've got enough cash flow to make debt, make debt service payments, and um, you are also are um, uh, uh, able to fund adequate reinvestment, fund depreciation at 120% of the level of annual depreciation. This is a test of are you able to renew your asset base? A new hospital bed costs more than an old hospital bed, so there has to be adequate cash flow to buy biomedical equipment and IT and do those things that are routine capital replacement uh, and investment type activities. The third threshold we call Thrive, that's debt service plus 120% of depreciation and then 4% operating expense on top of that. And that would be an indication, is there adequate cash flow to make a major strategic investment, a replacement hospital, a new bed tower, something really sizable that's a relevant level of performance for organizations that are in dynamic and growing and highly competitive markets. Or if you're an organization, and we've had some of these, where your age of plant has been allowed to just increase, there's not been um, adequate investment for maybe a couple of decades, uh, and the organization is clearly uh, struggling with a facility that's past its useful life, um, that's, that's a meaningful threshold if you're going to effectively replace uh, have a chance at replacing your your physical plant. Um, quality and consumer perceptions of quality. Again, actual data from a client of ours and uh, the same client and their competitive uh, uh, mix. They actually on this graphic, they're not the far right, they're the third from the left. They actually perform quite well on these indicators uh, and so are actually fairly well per, uh, positioned from a consumer perception uh, standpoint. Um, which is which is a, a positive thing. Value and cost, um, or value as, as a reflection of cost and quality, this is a, an analysis that we use with a lot of our clients. The vertical um, axis is the total performance score that's compiled by CMS. So it looks at HCAPs, it looks at uh, core measures, core clinical processes, and also looks at outcomes. And so the higher you are on this chart, the higher quality you are on the total performance score. The horizontal axis is a measure of cost. The further to the right you are, the, the, the lower cost you are. Um, so ideally, you'd want to be in the upper right-hand quadrant. The, the dotted lines represent, in this case, the average for the, the states where the hospitals are from that we're looking at. Um, and so that upper right-hand quadrant is both the higher quality quadrant and the lower cost uh, quadrant. Uh, that is where you, you would like to be and an important uh, measure of how you perform on an important set of uh, value indicators. In this case, you can see market share. Again, same client, significant movement um, of market share and one of their competitors has gone from being deep in the pack to being the second um, uh, largest recipient of patients from this client's primary service area. So significant movement um, um, in this space and on this indicator. Again, a source of risk. Appears to have stabilized, but it stabilized nine percentage points below what it once was in 2013. Based upon a set of financial, primarily financial analyses, um, um, we, we developed a framework. Uh, this comes out of that, that article that, that we referenced earlier uh, that Ryan and I authored. Uh, that looked at the relative um, performance and risk profile of an organization. And for this hospital, they actually were at the threshold of stable to stressed. Um, so actually a reasonable profile um, and having some room to maneuver, but with uh, some, some emerging uh, risk factors uh, that you can see on this chart. So do quite well, two out of three indicators um, that um, are positive, Op positive operating margin or positive margins has been a, um, a little more volatile for them. As we get into the stress indicator, they have two of those metrics where they, they check the box. Um, organizational growth is not presumed because of the loss of market share and um, also 
the 2014 dip in, in performance, and you can see the deterioration in market position reflected there. So they're, they're at that intersection of stable and stressed using this approach to organizational risk. When we apply our four domain um, risk uh, tool to this same client, um, the, the, the results were a little more mixed. Um, so what you can see here is an overall score of 0.65. We have a zero to one scale. Uh, the organization scores quite well on financial risk indicators. All of those are green with the exception of scale. Because they're relatively uh, small scale, that poses uh, some, some additional risk um, given just the, the finite and, and smaller pool of resources available. But on the financial indicator, they're 0.87 out of 1.0. So a good, um, robust score on financial. As we get into the other risk vectors, though, uh, the results are a little more mixed. So operating risk indicators, uh, even though profitability has been improving, um, the um, staffing ratios have really uh, uh, grown faster than uh, is sustainable. Um, case mix has deteriorated somewhat. Offsetting that payer mix has been positive. They're from a state that was a late adopter of Medicaid expansion, and the time period in question uh, shows the, the benefits of Medicaid expansion on their overall payer mix and financial performance. But then you can see a number of other indicators that are either mixed or uh, trending negative, and scale also is a negative factor here uh, as an operation. Uh, both economies of scale and skill, it's a challenge to sustain um, a hospital in a complex regulatory and operating environment when you're that size. Value risk, again, uh, score a little bit better than on operating risk, but still a mixed bag. Uh, score quite well on quality scores and aligned primary care base and patient panels, but a mixed bag on those other indicators. Um, market position, indicating a higher risk uh, in that category. Good on consumer preference, but losing significant market share. And they do have some pending uh, unmet needs on recruitment and renewal of their medical staff. So a lower score there. Uh, in this case, you can see their overall score puts them at the threshold of stressed moderate risk to stressed elevated risk um, overall. And it's really a result of those three other vectors. Financial, they do quite well, stable, modest risk. But when you look at operating, um, their stressed elevated risk. Uh, and when you look at the two other indicators, they're um, you know, right at that threshold between stressed moderate and stressed elevated. Uh, so it suggests by looking at a more holistic set of indicators and uh, doing a more holistic risk assessment, you get a, a more refined sense of emerging risk factors for this organization. A, a very financially focused uh, risk assessment we think would give you perhaps a, a uh, misleadingly um, a high score and perhaps a misleadingly low risk assessment for this particular client. So that the ability to look at multiple sources of risk uh, in, in a refined way can be really helpful for a board and a leadership team as they think about where their priorities should be uh, going forward to, to address risk and address opportunities and ultimately how to be really good stewards of that critical community resource. Next polling question, Kimberly. All right, uh, launching this right now. Um, what is your organization's greatest source of potential strategic risk? Is it financial? Is it operating? Is it in the market space? Or is it value? Get everybody to come back to life here on the keyboard. Um, again, this is um, what do you think your organization's greatest source of potential strategic risk is? Financial, operating, market, or value? Give people a few more moments to check in. It looks like we're running about 60%, say, financial. Um, tying operating and market are tied and value um, as at the low end. I'm going to close out of this and share the results with everyone. 55% at financial, uh, tied 18% for operating and market, and value coming in at 9%.
Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I think Ryan's going to take us through the, the final section here. Um, take it away, Ryan. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, as we turn now to, to risk mitigation and strategies for trying to neutralize or reduce risk, and it's just important to know that, and remind ourselves that time is never a neutral factor. Uh, Jeff and I have worked on engagements with prior clients in the past that have elected to um, pursue a partnership of some form or another, and uh, because of current circumstances, operating circumstances, or challenges that they faced, and uh, the, the issues that they that brought them to that decision um, continued to persist as part of uh, while the partnership process unfolded. Uh, so e even you know once you elect uh, whether to um, remain independent or pursue a partnership or focus internally on your own operations, um, competitors continue to to compete with you. Um, uh, regulatory frameworks are subject to change and just inerrant and unknown sources of risk continue to persist and one of the one of the challenges is trying to get to a decision point either as a leadership team or uh, as a set of board fiduciaries and doing it in a way that uh, builds consensus and ensures that folks are aligned in the decision to be made but doesn't necessarily uh, take too long because risk continue to persist. Um, you know, every every option, every strategic option that you elect and undertake carries with it those inherent risks. If it is uh, a strategy focused on independence and continuing to maintain your own operations, uh, you know, the, the challenges that you face today will continue to persist and you'll have to have strategies in place to address those, those risks factors. If it's a partnership, um, the, the, a partner may potentially be saddled with addressing your challenges and sources of risk, but you're really uh, left subject to their ability to, to meet and address those uh, sources of risk. Um, you know, looking back at this, um, this strategic risk matrix that Jeff has spoken to throughout the webinar today, the financial operating market and value vectors of risk, you know, there's a handful of initiatives beginning with the operating vector that we just uh, spent some time focusing on. Uh, we routinely find ourselves working with clients uh, who are trying to improve their operations, and when they do so, they're ordinarily focusing on a handful of issues. Um, staffing costs um, uh, are, without a doubt, the largest source of operating costs to hospitals and health systems. And trying to move your staffing model from one that uh, is maybe more fixed and doesn't adjust um, on a flexible basis to a staffing model that responds to constantly evolving patient um, volume and demand for services is truly important on trying to be an effective steward over the, the resources that have been entrusted to you as, as healthcare leaders. Um, over the last 15 years, with the number of physicians and physician practices being bought or assumed by health systems, uh, many health systems now find themselves tasked with making those provider practices uh, financially and operationally viable. Um, whether it's improving the productivity of those physician groups, looking at the uh, practice operations to ensure that all of your uh, staff are working at the top of their license and effectively utilizing their colleagues, uh, looking inside of provider practices for opportunities to enhance overall system operations has been a uh, tremendous source of opportunity that many of our clients have uh, uh, needed assistance with and been able to successfully move the needle. Uh, revenue cycle and coding uh, probably should come in no surprise to, to folks on, on today's webinar, uh, making sure that you are being uh, properly uh, uh, reimbursed for the services that you provided and that your charge code and the utilization of those codes matches with the actual experience on the, the med search floor or radiology or wherever it may be, and that the cost for your services is, is appropriate relative to uh, rates established uh, by CMS um, competitors and then your uh, privately negotiated rates with commercial insurers. Uh, for our clients that are critical access hospitals, maximizing your opportunity to uh, effectively receive um, uh, your costs 
uh, for your, uh, maximizing the opportunity for your cost to be properly reflected in your cost report is a is a tremendous uh, opportunity to help uh, improve your overall operations and our, our team members that work exclusively with critical access hospitals uh, have a number of experiences that they certainly can share and relate to where there's been opportunities to realize um, seven-figure improvements um, just off of ensuring the cost report was maximized and being most efficiently utilized. Uh, similarly, uh, practice or clinic designations around um, rural health clinics or provider-based clinics uh, currently provide uh, hospitals or health systems with an opportunity to maximize reimbursement given some preferential reimbursement regimes. And then just fundamental processes like uh, patient discharge planning, uh, ED admission, um, uh, things of that sort that make sure that the patient experience is being maximized and that those clinical operations are utilizing staff most efficiently really have the opportunity to um, work hand in hand with some of these other efforts and lead to enhanced operational efficiency and also improved patient experience. And then supply chain and purchasing um, are perennial issues to constantly monitor, monitor assess, and maximize um, efficiencies around any GPO utilization or uh, purchasing practices that uh, may be in place. Uh, in the terms of the value sector, um, you know, looking at those payer contracts and performing an annual review to make sure that your rates are uh, at market or properly reflect the strategic value that your organization brings to uh, patients and payer communities. We have a number of, of clients that sometimes go years or even decades without uh, performing that review or much less trying to approach the payers to try and enhance their uh, their contracting strategy and the rates that they receive. With the proliferation of, of value-based um, uh, reimbursement methodologies, uh, readmission uh, uh, reduction penalties, uh, value-based purchasing program, handful of other initiatives released through CMS, um, it really is important that you be able to focus on cost containment and enhancing um, clinical outcomes so that you can maximize opportunities under those value-based reimbursement methodologies. Uh, turning to the market vector, um, you know, sometimes, uh, well, it's not sometimes, but it's, uh, it's always a truth that you, you can't cut your way to prosperity. Um, yes, you should be efficient um, with the resources that you have in front of you, but eventually part of a strategy for long-term growth has to include um, organizational growth, adding to that uh, top-line revenue and um, doing it in a way that enhances contribution margin across the house. Uh, we routinely work with organizations to help them identify growth opportunities, um, relying on a number of uh, subscription databases, public databases, and some um, proprietary resources that we have. We can look at um, where anticipated growth is from clinical service volume, both on an inpatient or an outpatient basis, and, uh, and map out what your current market share levels are in those uh, different service offerings relative to competitors and whether or not that represents an opportunity to reapproach your operating platform and uh, add um, positive uh, value adding services into your delivery mix or focus on an ambulatory strategy that uh, allows you to serve new or strategic patient communities in ways that you haven't previously done so. And then in, in Increasingly, uh, we're, we have a number of clients that are uh, engaging in direct contracting with local area employers uh, to ensure some level of predictive volume in exchange for preferential pricing. Um, this has uh, been a strategy we've, we've seen clients utilize a number of times over the last five years and really allowed them to, to, to shore up market share and uh, receive um, stronger alignment with their local community, both employers and the employees as a result. And then finally, uh, in terms of financial performance, a lot of times this can be the, the leading vector that causes an organization to, to begin to look under the hood and address these other sectors of, of risk. Uh, the cash flow analysis that Jeff presented earlier, um, we routinely utilize that and any gap that an organization may have between that sustained level of cash flow and their current state cash flow uh, to, to help them develop 
and put in place performance improvement plan with specific initiatives that can target and help uh, reduce that gap. Um, quantifying your cash uh, run rate is of critical importance. If you're an organization that is uh, suffering on the further wing of that stress distress spectrum, um, knowing how much cash you have left available given your current uh, run loss rate is really important because it causes you to focus around those initiatives that are most important and then do those things to improve cash flow into the organization um, today. And then, you know, stepping back and ensuring that this review is conducted um, on a financial base of your financial performance over a longer term period of, of five years or so is, is of critical importance. Routinely, what we see with our clients when they're sitting through an annual audit review is it's it's typically just a review of uh, the most recent year's financial performance relative to the last year's. And while that certainly provides some insight or guidance, it, it often falls short in giving you that longer term picture and appreciation for where you've been as an organization relative to, to where you are today. And I think this uh, brings us to our next polling question. And I think in the interest of time, Ryan, I think we're going to skip uh, the the polling question and just um, um, conclude with a few quick comments and then um, I, uh, see if there's any questions. Um, do you want to walk us through this slide, Ryan, and then we'll we'll yeah, happy to, to happy to do happy to do so. So just you know stepping back and and summing up you know an analysis or review of these different risk factors and how you address those on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, just the, the first takeaway we'd leave you with is avoid analysis paralysis. While it's really important um, to collect as much information as you can and let that information and data help guide your decision-making process, uh, you're never going to have a, a full set of information to work with. Um, and it, you can let the, the, the good become the enemy of, of the perfect. And instead of doing that, what we counsel clients to do is um, make a really uh, robust and good faith effort to get as much information in front of you, um, but don't let that um, come to the detriment of eventually acting off of that information. This annual holistic risk review that we've described today that looks at these four different sectors, we really do um, feel rather passionately that that's an important and key approach to understanding your organization's overall risk profile. It, it moves further than just a simple financial analysis or looking at uh, a few operational metrics, but it does provide you that, that framework for appreciating how those four vectors interact with one another and really uh, provide a, a prediction over the, the more intermediate term for the trajectory of the organization. Um, you know, you got to focus on the long term. Uh, while you may have challenges in the present term that require you to hunker down, focus on key operations or uh, STEMI losses, eventually you, you do have to make that pivot to the long term. And that's where we think, you know, uh, making sure that that annual holistic review looks at a three to five year period, um, arms you with the most recent information from the prior year, but frames that in the context of, of where you've been. Uh, arriving at a consensus on what the risk factors or uh, variables are is critically important. Um, it's it's uh, unfortunately rather routine for us to find leadership teams or, or uh, boards that are not into a consensus as to what they should be focusing on or what they should be concerned about. But you know, spending um, some strategic and focused effort around identifying and building consensus among those fiduciaries around what those important risk variables are is really important because to the last point here, that then provides you with the focus that you need. Um, it's really easy to get distracted by the small brush fires that emerge when you're trying to run a health system or a hospital on a day-to-day -day basis, but having that consensus around what's important from a risk perspective and then focusing on that um, rather religiously um, has, has really proven in our experience and observation working with clients to have been rather valuable in their ability to improve the current state performance and put themselves onto a, a track uh, for longer term success. So thank you, that, uh, that Ryan. Concludes um, the formal portion yeah, of our, our presentation. Thank you, Ryan, for that. I appreciate um, your your partnership in, in presenting uh, this. We do have, I think, one question. 
Um, Kimberly, do you want to, to read the question? Yes, yeah, we do. Um, kind of a canary in the coal mine question. Are there, are there early warning signs that are, are really alarm bells that people should pay attention to um, in evaluating the risk profile? Um, great question. Um, I would say, first off, uh, it, it is important. Every situation is unique. Every organization, I, I think, is going to have its own unique uh, aspects to its risk profile. Um, but I, I, I would say um, thinking about the, our consulting practice and, and the organizations we've worked with uh, over the years, one of the indicators that I see as kind of an early precursor to an erosion of, of um, the organizational uh, overall uh, strategic positioning and, and elevation of risk is um, stagnant top line revenue. Um, that if, if you've gone a couple of years and, and top line revenue is flat, um, or perhaps it's been three or four years and top line revenue is growing uh, at a slower rate than um, uh, expenses, you know, less than a, than a percentage point annually, um, that's an indicator that you're not on the right track and you're not a sustainable track because so many of the, the cost uh, escalators, cost factors that hospitals and health systems have to deal with are growing at two, three percent or more uh, a year. So top line revenue, I think, is one of those things that's a, a certainly an indicator that things need to change to to um, improve the prospects of the organization. I think one of the, the other things I would suggest, um, just based upon the reaction we get, when we present a five-year uh, operating earnings before interest appreciation, operating EBITDA trend, that, that chart I, I shared earlier, that Ryan and I have, have worked with clients on, um, it usually is a kind of an, an oh wow moment for members of a, a board or even a management team who maybe not are not in the financial suite, um, just to see what that trend line looks like and how the organization's performance uh, maybe has, has remained stagnant, maybe has deteriorated, in some cases has improved. That starts to give people a really good holistic macro picture um, of what the trends have been, and operating cash flow is the lifeblood of the organization, um, given the need to uh, make investments. So, those would be two things that I would I would um, cite in response to that question. Ryan, did you have anything you wanted to to add to that? No, I think I pretty much agree with you, Jeff. There, that um, especially those organizations that we've worked with that are were unfortunately very highly distressed top line revenue um, over the preceding years and then um, operating EBITDA trajectory went hand in hand. And, and I would say that the, the follow on or corollary to kind of a, a stagnant top line revenue growth is you often see um, an aging medical staff, um, deferred investment, uh, and kind of a, a pent up set of capital and investment needs that coexist with that. And understandably why organizations need to to uh, uh, shepherd and steward their scarce resources, but it you start to see these these uh, results cascading as a result of the, the the flat top line revenue or stagnant top line revenue. So, thank you, Jeff and Ryan. We're coming right at the top of the hour, so excellent uh, way to end up the webinar. Uh, to reiterate, I will be sending the materials to everyone who registered. Um, and on behalf of my colleagues at Stratwater Associates here in Portland, Maine, Atlanta, and Nashville, um, we thank you so much for sharing this hour of your day with us. Thank you.